Hi, Hadessa. How are you? I'm good. Thank God. How was your day? My day is interesting. I'm following all the different things that are happening here in Israel. and But my focus, uh, luckily, is on rebuilding. Rebuilding uh, new families who... Uh, who have been broken for all sorts of reasons, so but I'm looking to help to rebuild. So I yeah. focus on when when I'm feeling uh, things are challenging, I focus on trying to find shiduchim. That gives me encouragement. That's actually. a good thing. That's a good thing. Yeah, Thinking yeah, positive. Yeah, that's a good thing. Okay, for the sake of the people who've already joined, let's just start. Okay. So hi, my name is Marit Hoffman. I'm an elder law lawyer and a gerontologist. And my focus is mainly helping senior citizens when they reach um, significant junctions in their lives, such as preparing wills and enduring PAV attorneys, prenups for second relationships, and also dealing with trust issues and um, people who have dual citizenships, anything to do with their estate planning. And from my broad exposure with this age group, I found that there's a lot of other topics that are extremely important that not are not enough spoken about. So I've ha started having this uh, podcast for the last two years where I'm addressing all kinds of issues that concern um, senior citizens or elderly people um, with other professionals that deal also with those issues. And today we're going to actually be dealing with something very interesting, calling the challenges in later life relationships. We're going to be talking about that with Hadassah Meller Bentolila. And basically, uh, we're going to be discussing the important considerations for couples that when they enter new relationships, particularly when we're talking about later in life, um, we're going to be covering the practical, the emotional, and we're going to touch also on the legal stuff. So before, first and foremost, Hadassah, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Thank you. So I'm Hadassah Meller Bentolila. I'm a group facilitator by profession, and I'm currently the director of a group called Mo'adon Magalim Shalalev, a Circles of Love Club. And this is a club for people who are interested in creating second marriages. And I'm actually dealing with uh, people who are divorced or widowed from the age of 35, and most recently up to the age of even 76. And I'm getting a lot of uh, uh, people turning to me 70 and up. Um, because people are expecting longer lifespans and they don't really want to be alone for that time of their life. Many of them are still functioning and have lots of energy and want us to live a full life. So it's an exciting time where we're able to help people, even in the elder stages of life, create new marriages and new relationships. That's really wonderful. It's so true because life expectancy is so much longer. People are living longer. As you said, they don't want to live by themselves. They feel they have like a second chance. Absolutely. And happiness, that love and companionship. Yeah. Yeah. I personally, I get, I, I told you this, I, I get a lot of inspiration. My grandfather um, made Ali after my grandmother passed away. He made Ali at 81. And in the old age home, he met his second wife and they got married when he was 82. She was 79. And they lived together for nine years in the, in the home together. And they took care of each other. And I, I sincerely believe that he lived longer. He lived till the age of 96 uh, after having been married to her. I believe that, you know, that that relationship was part of his longevity. Absolutely. I think you're so right. It makes such a big difference. OK, while we're starting to sort of talk about these topics, let's just start with finding the suitable partner. Why don't you just touch up on that a little bit? Sure. So a lot of people, first of all, you know, when they get to this age, they're feeling very lonely. They don't quite know what to do and where to find somebody. And they generally they'll start with looking at um, websites and often they get very frustrated with the websites because sometimes, you know, there's not people in their age range or, or they're meeting people who are really not suitable. So um, one of the things that I've done is I've created a WhatsApp group where people can put up their profiles. I have one for Anglos and I also have um, divided by age group. And I have one specifically for widows and also Kohanim who have a specific issue and they can only marry either somebody who's single and at 70, you're not usually going to meet somebody who's single. So it's got to be somebody who's widowed. Um, and so I've created those groups and people can post their profiles. And this is a way that I can help to match up match people up and actually on, on uh, Rosh Hashanah I was walking down the street and somebody who knew a widow and a widower that I had actually set up told me how wonderful their second marriage is and how they each had never believed that they could love again 
And uh, it was just like a very touching moment because I, I didn't know how their marriage had, I, I introduced them, but I didn't know that they, their marriage had continued to develop. And it's very exciting to hear that, you know, people really can develop. I think it's a more mature relationship also. One of the things about second marriage is that I find um, it's, it's, it has a different kind of quality often. Right. A second marriage, you know, you, you, first of all, you just start it at a mature, more mature level. Right. Okay. Right. So, right. But there's more appreciation of each other and not taking each other for granted. And, and there's also each person is already kind of stood on their own feet. So now they're not so dependent on each other, but they choose to live together and to create a, a common life. And that's already, again, it's a different uh, stage of life often, and it's a different way of looking at the relationship. Um, the other the other thing I find that's uh, special often about a, a relationship at this stage of life is you're not bringing up children, you know, small children. So you're more free to be there with each other and to choose the kind of things that you're going to do together. And I find it very exciting. And I and I always say there's uh, infinite possibility of, of what you can once once you're as far as long as you're still alive, there's infinite possibility of what you can still create with your life. Um, and that's a choice. And I'm not saying that there, there are not always many, many options at this age. However, it's it's worth um, kind of thinking what is most important, what is most important to me at this stage of my life and who could fit that bill? In other words, some people decide that they want to live in one house together. Some people decide that each one keeps their own house and they're still going to have a relationship. But but the most the most important thing is that um, we choose we choose to be together. And we're going to work it out. We're going to be flexible about figuring out how we can figure it out. Um, for example, like uh, sometimes people turn to me and they say, well, oh, well, he lives far away. So then, no, oh, it's never going to work. And, and I always say, wait a minute. It, nobody is going to move and change their whole life habitat because they're meeting someone on the first date. You know, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense for somebody to move uh, with someone that they haven't met yet. But if you go out with them and you meet with them and you develop a relationship, then together, once there's already a relationship, now we can think, well, what is the best way to make this relationship work? The question is already from a different place. Once we already have a relationship, then we can think, okay, let's think of a creative solution. Maybe it's being part-time by you and part-time by me. Maybe it's being Shabbatot and weekdays in different places. Maybe it's finding a third place, which would work for us. It's, it's kind of thinking about the creative solutions to make the relationship work. But once you're already in a relationship, it's a lot easier to reach solutions. Absolutely. And it's really interesting what you're saying is so true because when you're in a second relationship, especially if there's no children at home anymore, you really can get creative. The one house, two house thing is something that I see more and more happening. Like once, um, you know, I don't even a couple of years ago, it wasn't, so, it was unheard of once you're married or in a serious relationship, either move close by or you get married and you live in the same house and that's it. Right. Whereas now it's not, it's not so, it's not something that's a given, meaning a lot of people stay in their house because of a lot of other considerations that they have to take into account and they make it work as a relationship with two houses. Yes, I'm also, I'm also hearing more and more of that in the last five years. Yeah, so, and, and so. you know, it brings me to the topic about spending holidays because, you know, you have your kids, his kids, maybe sometimes you have our kids and you have your house and his house and family. How? What do you hear about all that subject? Because that's, especially now since we are in the holidays, how does that work? Right. So first of all, I hear a lot of people that first of all, before they even get into a relationship, they're very scared about it. Right. They say, well, how would this how would a relationship work? Because I'll have to give up my time with my kids. OK. And and I, and I always try to say to people, OK, it's true that there's going to be a price to pay. However, there's also going to be um, how would you say rev? How do you say rev in English? It, there's there's gain. You know, there's, there's, yes, that's it. Thank you. There's benefits. There's benefits. There's also benefits to you, first of all, because you're not going to be alone and your energy level. If you have a partner and your energy level is higher, your children are going to gain from that. And I also feel that there's the children gain from uh, my my mentor Hedy Schleifer. She says the children live in the space between the parents. Okay, and so when a parent is alone. They're not getting the, the the benefit of that space, that that space of love that they that they get the energy from. 
And, and when you come as a new couple, even as an older couple, you know, the, the children also get the benefit of learning from your relationship. And I, and I think that's something we don't, we don't, we don't always see. You know, when I say we, we bring these children into a, a new space of relationships and, and they also gain and learn from that for their own relationship and for also for the way they, they'll see their older, their uh, older themselves in older age. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I really think that can be an example. It's, it's kind of renewing the example, especially if these children went through a divorce or if they went through uh, somebody passing away, for them to see the rebuilding and that you can always, always have a chance for growth. I think that's, uh, I think that's very important. So there's, they're also gaining. Um, so I think it's important to have a kind of perspective of, yes, it's going to take an adjustment period and they're not going to be used to mind having a new partner and they may resist it at the beginning, but that's normal. You know, if there's no resistance, that's not normal. But mm -hmm. if they resist it a little bit, but we're able to get through that resistance, usually often uh, there is renewed uh, connection, which I find uh, fascinating in itself of how that works. I, I will say that I know quite a few couples who do different models. For example, I know one couple who got married when they were older, and they decided not to mix their, not to blend their families. Uh, the couple goes on vacation with her family, and the couple goes on vacation with his family, but the children are not blended. Um, and he, in this case, particular case, he has uh, more money, so he'll take them on a, on a let's say, a vacation to Chutzlaret, uh, to, to, you know, and then on the, and the woman has less, they'll go camping, you know, but, but they each have their kind of family traditions. But the, but the partner does join. That's one model. I know another family that actually the couple that says, no, we're a couple, we're coming to every place as a couple. So they have a plan that they have a six week map. This, the first week we go to his children. The second week we go to her children. The third week we stay at home. The fourth week we, in other words, they have a rotation. They have some kind of rotation of where they're going to spend each of the Chagim or each of the Shabbatot during the year. That's interesting. Um, Wait, you know, I was just thinking about, well, you were saying something regarding the, the holiday season. I was thinking, especially when one is alone for a period of time, sometimes the children feel obligated to spend time with that parent because they don't want to be, the, they don't want the parent to be alone. It's not necessarily really, really, as, as the kids get older, I mean, not necessarily what they would have wanted to do, but they feel that they are obliged to do. Once that person has a partner, it sort of relieves them of that duty, so to speak, when they can they can come if they want to. And it's coming from a different point where they're coming because they want to come and not because they're coming because they have to come. And I think okay. that makes a lot of difference, too. Absolutely. I, I find that there, yes, that sometimes the children feel it's a burden. Exactly. Uh, they're not going to say, they don't want to say it because they don't want to insult the parent. Right. But, uh, but yes, they feel it's a burden. The parent is dependent on them as opposed to them being dependent on the parent. And once there's a once there's a new partner, it relieves some of that duty of having to be there. But I do think, um, you know, it's sometimes um, there's a concern, though, that the partner will have to take care of a person if they get sick. So I think it's important. Maybe that's also where you come in is sometimes is that it's important to be able to. Um, to know in advance that if one of the partners becomes sick and needs extra care, that the children will still be involved. In other words, it won't necessarily all fall on the on the new partner um, to be the caretaker. And I think that's something important to discuss um, before before getting involved in a second relationship, especially at an older age. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, if we're talking a little bit about the legalese point of view, as Definitely, there are things that the person should really seriously consider before entering a new relationship. I mean, finalizing the new relationship into a marriage or a common law spouse. Um, two major things are the will and the prenup. Uh, actually, three things, the will, the prenup, and an enduring power of attorney. Um, and that requires really to have a serious conversation with everybody involved because, first of all, regarding the will, there's always this tension when there's a new partner, especially if, if the person has assets. So thinking, oh, wait a minute, is this new partner, the children might be worried about their inheritance. Is this new partner coming and then going to take all the inheritance from me? And mm -hmm. it it doesn't help them sort of be acquainted really with that new partner because there's always worry about what's going to happen with their money so a lot of people the first thing they do is arrange a will not not just for the children but also for themselves they want to be very 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 clear with the other spouse i love you very much it doesn't mean that everything that i own now goes to you and vice versa um i still have children and i want to take care of my children and and 
there's nothing we can do. Children are, are always a priority or they have their own, you know, their own special space that mm -hmm. nobody really can take away from them. Um, and the same thing regarding what you said, when people are, are becoming ill and they have mental capacity issues, that's the enduring power of attorney document that takes care of them. And there's a, a specifically when we're talking about second marriages or common law spouses, it's a serious, serious conversation to be had. Um, just as, a, as an example, somebody is uh, married or in a very serious relationship, but living in the other person's house and right. suddenly he doesn't become well. What does that mean? Does that mean that there's going to be a caregiver in that person's house? Yes or no. It's not a given because the the person who owns the house might say, I, I love you and I want you to be here, but I don't necessarily want your caregiver here. I don't even have room for a caregiver. I might feel uncomfortable with a caregiver. Might be that if, God forbid, something like that happens, you it might be better to be moved to a facility or even for you to have your own space at that in that position. That's when the kids also should get involved. And, you know, there, there should be a whole serious discussion about that because it's not a given or even the opposite. If she, let's say the house is owned by the female and she's moved out for whatever reason, what does that mean for him? Does he get to stay in the house? Does he not get to stay in the house? Right. And then that's when her children might be worried about what happens with the house right now. So it's, it's super important to have all these things legally sorted out. Um, for everybody's peace of mind, for their peace of mind, for the couple's peace of mind, and also for the children's peace of mind. So absolutely, these things should really be sorted out in advance. Right. And then I heard a story about a woman who, who was in somebody else's house, and then he passed away, and then and then the children want to take her out of the house. So that, that you know, I, I actually heard um, a lawyer speak about the fact that a widow might also, if she's living in someone's house for quite a while, she might also get compensation for what she's contributed to that house, not just not even just the house itself. Absolutely. That's also something to be something to be taken into consideration and, and discussed, obviously. Absolutely. I do. I do have. Um, we were just talking about the holidays is, is I also know that some couples, for example, choose to each go to each of their, their children separately, that Dafka on the, those holidays, each of us will go to our, our respective children and we'll meet up again after the holidays, you know, which is also another possibility. I think, mm -hmm. I think the main thing here is to be open to possibilities in order to, there was what possibility do we have that will make it work for us? You know, that that's, uh, I, I think that's the main consideration. And, and when we're talking about second marriages, we, we, an ideal second marriage, we would like all of the, all of the part, people involved to feel that they are respected, that they belong, and that they're taken into consideration, and ideally that they're also loved. You know, the love part, we don't always necessarily love someone that we don't know or that our parents chose, chose but at least we can respect them. In right. other words, we have to make a, a differentiation between the way we feel about the person and the way we, we behave towards that person. In other words, we may not love them immediately because we don't know them yet, but it's our, you know, we want to be able to respect those people and we want our children to feel that they belong as well and that they're taken into consideration and often when there are um you know conflicts in these kind of relationships is because we haven't necessarily looked at it from the other person's point of view you know how they're seeing it so the, one of the things that can help is that we can kind of uh, imagine that we're going into their shoes and how do they see the the constellation of the family what's their position in the family and why are they feeling right now left out or not considered or or that they don't belong and if we can kind of pay attention to that it's we can we can uh, be more empathetic at least you know it won't necessarily change the situation but at least we can say you know i understand i hear you and i understand how you feel about that or i can hear that you're angry and we're still going to behave respectfully <laughs> You know, that's that that's something that that um that can be helpful in, in those kinds of situations. Um and I think before you before you move on, I think communication really is what you're saying is key here, meaning when you bring in a new partner for children who are much older, and older is varies on the age right. but at, as old as you are that's still your parent you feel like that is your parent and not somebody else's um communication is so important as and you communicate with your child depending on the age and depending on the circumstances and it could well be that it might be you know the be the best thing to do is take everybody out for supper just the children and yourself or take off a day and do a spa day or something where you can really relax 
and speak to the children and 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 have a, a have a conversation and i love the idea of saying why don't you pretend and you can just do even a role play why don't you pretend you are x and how would he feel when he hears what you're saying or how do you feel when you hear what i'm saying and communication is so important it brings up everything right. to the surface and once everything's to the surface it's much easier to deal with yeah, I do remember that when my grandfather got remarried, my my aunts and uncles were a bit nervous, you know, they say, what, what is this all about? You're bringing someone new and you're going to forget our mother. And how could you start something at this age? And and he was like, well, I'm still alive and I and I would still like to live, you know, and I, I do remember, though, that my parents were, were actually pretty pleased because it did take some burden off of them because she also took care of him. You know, she she called the doctor when he needed and she noticed when things were happening with him and what he needed and and uh, and she made him dinner, you know, and, and those things those things were important and to, to be able to divide up the the responsibility of taking care of of an older child so definitely discussing you know what is my role what is your role um and and making sure that those those things are are clear and one of the things that's interesting when when you blend when you try to blend two families often people are like they want to make it blend perfectly and that everybody should get along you know well right. it doesn't always go that way because sometimes people are jealous of the, the couple is going to this couple more and then they're not coming to us and all kinds of different feelings that that get um that get brought up. And one model that, that kind of has helped me to understand this is that um you know often if uh it's it's called tribe tribe centered and what 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 this mean what this means is that that some often like if we move into a new family, they have a different culture, right? So if they have a different culture, we say, well, why do they do things this way? Why do they hang the laundry this way? Why do they eat this kind of food, right? Clearly, we have different we have different cultures in our families. So the idea is when we try to blend families, it's almost like doing a merger, right? It's So you have to see, well, what's the vision of this family? What's the vision of this family? Okay, they do it for a certain reason. They're not doing it against us. You know, they're not doing it to get us. <laughs> they're not behaving this way to get us. This is the way they've always behaved. So one of the things that's helpful is kind of to be curious. Oh, I wonder why they do this, you know, or, oh, let's see, what are the benefits of doing it their way? Or what are the, or let's explain why this is important to us. In other words, instead of trying to make everybody do the same, it's, it's being able to learn from each other's cultures. And that helps us to expand and grow versus to be fighting about doing it our way or doing it your way. And, and one of the things that can happen is you can have two cultures within the same tribe, two different families within the same tribe. In other words, we each have maintain our family culture. However, we're also all connected in the bigger tribe. And uh, this is a, it's kind of a model which has helped me to understand how each family can still contain their own identity, but they can also belong to the, to the larger picture. Um, love I, find, that. I love that. Right? Yeah. You know, it's funny because you're saying, yes, we're not all going to be Brady Bunch, right? That's right. That's exactly. It's, it's not <laughs> right. always going to be great, but even, and also, but also learning, I think when you have a blended family, it's work in progress all the time. So yes. you can have a really good day and think, Ooh, that's it. But no, it doesn't necessarily mean that it, there could be a huge dip the day after. I mean, it's right. always working, working, working. And what you said about the tribe is so good is, is so smart because even in your own family, you have you can have siblings which are very, very different from each other and have different lives. And if they get married, they have different partners and they have different houses, but they're still a tribe. You're still one big family. And when right. you have another family or blended family, it just makes that tribe even bigger with bigger differences, maybe, or, or other differences or more differences. But as you just said, we're just one big tribe with a lot of people in it, which have different opinions, different ways of handling things. Right. So true. It's so right. True. So I think it's it's like taking a zoom out and seeing the the larger picture of of the group. You know, who are the different different parts of our group, and how can we allow our group to be able to contain different types of opinions and different types of behaviors, and 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 to find it fascinating and interesting. Mm -hmm. That, that we have some things in common and in, in some ways we're different and we can learn and grow from each other. And you know, it just gives a, a way to look at it that's not just like, uh, otherwise it can be very like, you know, why, why are they doing this? Why are they doing that? No, we don't do it that way. It's our way or no way. You know, and that, that those are the kinds of, of attitudes that create conflict. Right. So, so Mehmet, when we start getting into conflict, we want to look, wait a minute, who here is not feeling respected? Who here is not feeling taken into consideration? Can I consider their point of view? 
Um, can I shift my viewpoint and 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 understand things in a different way? And those are some of the things that help to deal with some of those uh, complications because there, it is going to be, it's going to be, I say it's, it's like a puzzle, you know, it is going to be different pieces and different parts that are put together, but we can look at the bigger picture. A hundred percent. And also, you know, it's just brought me to the thought about when we're talking about two houses or when one moves into somebody else's house, that's not necessarily, doesn't necessarily work for everybody because especially if you are moving into the other spouse's house, you're always going to, you may, you may find yourself feeling like a visitor in that house. That house is still that person. And the children, when they come, your children, when they come to visit in that house, it's still not your house or our house. It's still his or her house, the other, the other spouse. That's not necessarily a good thing. Sometimes if there's so much, um, I don't know about rivality or animosity or just bad feelings in general, sometimes it might be a good idea to just have a new house, which is new for you and new for me. It could be a rental. doesn't mean you have to go buy something. Um, I have a, actually know a lot of friends that that's what they did. They, they rented out their homes, each of their own homes respectively, and then they rented out one big house for them both. And they mm -hmm. felt that they can both put input in that house meaning she can have the red wall he can put his i don't know guy stuff and they all feel and they both feel like it's their house and when their kids came to visit nobody felt that it belongs more to one side or the other because it was new for everybody right that's really creating a third space it's not my house it's not my house or your house it's our house and and we're creating we're creating the third option <laughs> for, exactly right exactly. not my way or your way but the third way it's which is is a creative way for for all of us to be together and often what that does emotionally is that people will be take feel like they've been taken into consideration like if we have an extra guest room so that our kids can come or exactly. um, they feel like they feel like they're getting an upgrade rather than being um stuffed into something that doesn't belong to them you know or something like that and, and then, so we want to actually f help people feel like our new relationship is going to create benefits for all exactly um, exactly exactly and and you know while you're thinking about other stuff to talk about, was just the other thing that came up to me was was the whole prenup thing which interesting and left now more and more people are realizing that it's important to have whereas at the beginning um beginning like five or six years ago it was less common um i was hearing things of um it's not romantic to have a prenup yeah. or it takes so much time to find this guy it usually was the woman so much time to find this guy i'm going to start talking about money it sort of makes it all icky i don't right. want it um i think now more and more people are realizing the importance and the significance of having a prenup, first of all, for your own assets, because a lot of people come out of a divorce or even if they're a widow, they have assets they've accumulated that they wanna make sure stays theirs and they don't wanna necessarily share it with the other partner and they wanna make sure that it stays theirs um, or inheritance that they received or their apartment that they're going to have the other person live in with them. Um, so that's super important. Also for their children, it's super important so that they understand, you know, everybody sees these are my assets. These assets are going to be transferred to you when you pass, when I pass away, you don't have to worry. So that diffuses that whole worry of is he or she in it for the money because they're not going to get necessarily the money. The money stays in the family. Right. And most importantly is for the relationship itself, because instead of worrying at the back of your head, worrying about the money issue, okay. Is he paying for this? Am I paying for this? How much is he paying? How much is he putting in the kitty? Um, what about going out? Is he going to put the money? But it's not romantic if I pay for it. All these stupid things are not really stupid when you have them all the time in a relationship. When you diffuse them by actually having a, um, a real discussion about it beforehand, and that is part of the prenup process. Then once it's done, it's sort of done. The elephant in the room is no longer there. You can go and have your, you know, happily ever after life because mm -hmm. you've sorted all that stuff out. It's not going to be something that you have to second guess the person. Um, the money issues, hopefully most of it have been sorted out in an agreement and that's it. You can just move on. Right. So I think one of the things that you're saying is people in general have a tough time talking about money. <laughs> okay. <Absolutely. laughs> 
So, so especially in second marriage, especially if it's also in our first marriage, it was an issue. And it, it, it was one of the things that got became uh, complicated when we separated. Now I'm going to talk about it with my, my second husband. I don't want to get separated from them. You know, I don't want it to become a conflict. So it's even more of an issue because we're, we're sitting on top of trauma from the last relationship. Exactly. And it's very difficult to discuss it. And, and we feel weak if we've lost money and things like that. And, and so... or we've made mistakes with money, maybe we don't want to share that, you know, it's, it's, it's very, it's a very sensitive topic. And one of the things is also when people get married, they wonder like, are we going to split everything Exactly. between the two of us? Or are we going to each keep our own bank accounts? And then we're going to have a, uh, uh, you know, uh, how do we Like say a piggy that? bank, like a, Yeah, it's like a piggy. a coupon for the house, like a, an account that's for the house expenses. Or, or exactly who pays for what, who pays for vacations, like you're saying. Exactly. So one of the things I think it's really important to come to someone like you, who's a professional in this area, because we're not going to be discussing it by ourselves. You know, there's, there's a third person in the room who can be a little bit more objective and also give us more perspective on what's important to talk about. And I, I personally find it, it's a relief that there's a professional that, that understands about this, because, Right, uh, right. because if we have to deal with it on our own, we could go to the therapy for years. <laughs> Exactly, that's exactly. But if it's worked out, but if it's worked out, then things are things are a lot clearer, and and uh, and it doesn't become as much of uh, as much of an issue. Uh, I know I also have um, an uncle who got married uh, later after my aunt passed away, and you know, and also the, the the children are concerned about how much money is being spent, and and one of the things uh, again when when you have a clear prenup, those things are easier, Exactly. and it's and it's important to take care of it even if we don't like even if we don't like to. I can tell you from my personal experience that I I married a widow. And I didn't expect, I expected everything to go okay. He knew what he was doing in terms of like insurance and, and none of us expected. Unfortunately, he passed away after we were married for three and a half years. So, so the thing is, none of us expected that to happen, you know, for lightning to strike twice on the second person, but we all die eventually. We never know when. And, and, uh, and we don't know when, when it's going to be the day that we die and it could be tomorrow. You know, I hope that we live a long life, but, but it could be tomorrow and we really should be prepared. And one of the things that I, I uh, found out was that his insurance policy was written on his first wife's name and he never changed it, Exactly. you know? And, and so, and that made a difference for what my child got versus his first, his children from his first marriage, who I loved and cared about, you know, but it, it just, it just became, it be and so it became a, a mess. And it's a shame for those things to, sometimes they also ask, even after we go out, we're gone, they make a problem for our children. Absolutely. And we don't want, so we want to be prepared so that even after we're gone, they, their sailing is smooth. And they have an easier time and they don't have to fight with our previous spouse also. I think especially after we're gone, we want to make sure that it's sort of sorted out. Yeah, Right. but but I, I hear so many stories about people that have their life insurance and they forgot and it's still left um, in the name of the ex-wife. And it is such an easy thing to solve if you just remember to do it beforehand. You know, you have this like summer, like uh, summer cleanup, you know, like before Easter or for Jews, you have it before Pesach. So it should be like one of your summer summer cleaning up things that once a year you go over all your financials and you check what you have, what you don't have, what's registered on whom, do you want to make changes to that and just keep being updated about these things and make sure that they're updated accordingly, according to the circumstances that you have in life. So, so important, really Yeah, important. I, I agree. It's the kind of things we tend to push under the carpet, you know, and, and, and I think having a connection with someone you, with like you is to remind us, hey, wait a minute, these are not difficult. Really, they're not that difficult. If you just make a phone call, you can change it, but but you have the support uh, to do it in, in, on a yearly basis and to keep yourself up to date to make sure that that everything, you know, after you're gone goes, goes smoothly. And it's also, and I was saying, you're saying it's not romantic. I, I actually think it is romantic because in, in essence, you're taking, it's like giving an insurance policy. To your, to your spouse, you know, and it's that, that in itself is, I love you. Therefore I'm going to take care of you even after I'm gone. Yes, that perspective, yes. It's also like, you know, it's funny, you can call it legal spring cleaning if you want. But yes, absolutely. There is a romantic side of it. And also it makes, you know, it makes everybody feel secure. Oh, okay, I'm going to be taken care of. I'm not going to, you know, and the other person thinking I'm taking care of her and I'm also taking care of my children. That's My correct. children are still going to be okay. 
um, yeah, all these issues that should really be spoken about. It's really important. Again, we're coming up to, again, as everything we're discussing, everything revolves around communication. Yes. It's very, very important communication. Yes. Um, I, I would agree. And, and one of the things also is that um, a lot of times people don't want to get married. They say, oh, if I don't get married, then um, I won't have to deal with these issues again. Like, in other words, in my divorce, I had all these conflicts about money. So I'll just be in a relationship and I won't get married. Well, guess what? It doesn't work that way. And you can tell us more about that. But but uh, as far as I know, if you're, you know, there's common law partners. It's, it's, exactly. it's, uh, in Israel, if you once you're living with somebody, you're sharing a common home, then it's as if you're married and it doesn't really matter. Uh, there's a, I mean, there's a lot more criteria. We're not going to get into it, but 100%. In general, yes. A common law spouse is like a regular married spouse. There is no difference um, legally wise about what he can get or what she can get from when one passes away, 100%, yes. You know, I personally feel that marriage connects us on a soul level, you know, so it's a different, it's a different, uh, it's a different meaning to, to the, than a common law marriage. However, for, for those people who are not getting married because of the, because of the legal ramifications, they really need to check um, in terms Absolutely. of what, what it means uh, for their relationship and what it means for their children, et cetera, the same as, same as they would if they were committing to marriage. A hundred percent. Absolutely. You're right. Okay, we're near the end of this podcast. I can't believe it because I could speak to you forever. Um, <laughs> do you want to give us before we end some tips or something, you know, to leave us with some idea? Sure. Um, so I, I just want to say that um, I, I'll, 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 I'll share one thing that I, I actually think that even at a later age, one should also consider uh, going to therapy as a couple and and one shouldn't say oh yeah I did that when I was younger because there's some tools that can be learned that can make relationships so much better I I, I feel, find that therapy is not for when we get all only when we get into a um we we get into a conflict it really as far as I'm concerned it's part of creating an ideal second relationship because we're more mature we have we have more tools and and the the therapy when we have an objective person who's helping us to to communicate as we said um then we have a lot greater chance of our of our marriage flourishing and becoming even better that would be one thing the, uh, the other thing i want to suggest is that um there's something that i we call oganim zugim which in english would be um what's the anchors anchors <laughs> that would be the relationship word. anchors that's right. Relationship anchors. One of the challenges of, of second marriages is, is that we have so many other things going on in our lives. We do have our children and sometimes people still have work and and we have whatever's going on in the world. And and like the day to day and we have to take care of our bodies as we get older is more and more time that's spent on making sure that our bodies are functioning. And, you know, it's going to the doctor and there's going to exercise and everything that we need to do to take care and all these things about life are so sometimes so overwhelming that we forget to take the time to uh, to connect. And so, um, one of the things that I've learned from my relationship teachers is that it's really important to take even three times a day to take time to connect to your partner. And so we do it like um, like we do uh, prayers services, even like morning services, afternoon services, and evening services. It's how do we keep our connection? So we're going to keep our connection in the morning to our partner, in the afternoon, and in the evening. So one thing you can do is in the morning is just take a minute to look into each other's eyes before if you're going to leave the house and everyone's going to go off or and come back together, or if you're just going to eat breakfast together, but take a few minutes to look into each other's eyes or to give each other a hug, just to find a minute for connection before we start our day. That'd be one thing. In the afternoon, maybe it's just sending a WhatsApp. If we're if we're not together, how are you? How are you doing? And if we are together, how are you feeling today? You know, or what's your energy like? Or what can I do to help you bring up your energy? You know, it's just to connect in the, in the afternoon. And in the evening, you might want to ask each other, what are we grateful for today in our relationship? Or what was me what was something meaningful that happened to you or that happened to me? Just to kind of synchronize, to share, and to remember to connect, um, because our relationships are are complex. And we each have so many different things that we're handling on our plate. But that time for connection is, is very, very important. And, um, and and another one is to make sure that we have dates. You know, maybe it's once a week, maybe it's once every two weeks, but to put it in our calendars. You know, we don't just have a going to the doctor's appointment and going and to take care of the grandchildren. We also want to have in our calendar, yes, tonight is the day, the night that we're going out, or maybe we're going out for lunch because we like to go to bed early. I don't know. But, but, 
finding the time that we really take the time uh, once a week or once every two weeks to make the time to be with each other. Um, and so that's, uh, that's important. And, and one more thing I can add is one of the things that I did with my um, late husband is we were taught to uh, something called the appreciation visit. And the appreciation visit is that on Friday afternoons, we sit across from each other, we look into each other's eyes, and we just share what we appreciated about each other this week. And um, and we did this for six, we learned it about six months before my husband passed away. And we every Friday, we would sit in the garden and share what we appreciated. And unfortunately, six months later, he passed away. But when he did, I felt like I had said everything I wanted to say. And he had told me everything he wanted to say that what we had to say with each other to each other was done. And so I offer that uh, as a gift for, for, for those who would like to take it on. I, I think it's, um, it's something that's really much more possible in second marriage because we don't take things for granted. And in a second marriage, we can really pay attention to what it is that we're blessed to have in our relationship and what it is we can appreciate and to remember to say it and to remember to say it to that person. And I find it's... Um, I've practiced this in new relationships even since my husband has passed away. And when I teach this to people, they say, wow, otherwise I would be looking at everything you do wrong all week. But focusing on this exercise, knowing that at the end of the week, I'm going to have to share what I appreciate. It changes my whole look, the way I look at you the whole week long. I have to yeah. think about the things that I want to gather about what I appreciate about you. So that's a, it's a very powerful exercise. And anyone who would like to take it on, if you can't do it every week, so do it on Rosh Chodesh, do it once a month. <laughs> I think that's a beautiful thing. That's such a beautiful thing. It's, it's basically to focus on the positive and to take the time to focus on the positive of that person. I think that's really yeah. lovely. Thank you so much, Odessa. Thank you so much for being with us. You're welcome. Um, thank you for everybody who's watching. I wish you guys a the rest of the week. Have a good week. Uh, stay safe. And I'm looking forward to seeing you all in, in my next podcast. Bye for now. Thank you, baby.